everybody and welcome to Table Takes. Today is October 9th and we are feeling all right, you know, as much as you can do in 2020. Uh, speaking of, you know, just 2020, how was, uh, you know, Hades? Derek, huh? Uh, Hades is great. Uh, if anybody has been living under a video game rock uh, and doesn't know about it, it's the the game from Supergiant that's kind of like swept everyone's attention. Uh, I loved mm-hmm. all their previous games, Bastion, Transistor, the story, the gameplay, the music are all great. Uh, so, you know, I basically just waited for Hades to get out of early access and to be available on a Mac. And then I bought it and fell in love. And after like 40 something runs, I uh, quote unquote escaped. Uh, and I'm still playing the game. Uh, still having fun, still trying to uh, get Ms. Dusa to calm down and not run away from me the moment our conversations are done. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's it's fantastic. It's cute. Oh, I, I want to talk about it more. It's just, it's the type of game that has so many little swirls and revelations mm-hmm. and things. I can't uh, say too much about it. I, I would just say just go play it because uh, there's so much great stuff in there. Yeah, it's it's, really it's fantastically well written. I love it. I love it so much. Um, mm-hmm. So that was the big news. Smaller news. Uh, I got a promotion, and I am now director of events at Gen Con. So Yay! it is my kingdom. Captain, my captain, mm-hmm. captain, my captain, go. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no. Congratulations, Derek. We all bear round of applause given to Thank you, you for you. getting Thank that you. level up. There you go. Uh, uh, speaking of which, somebody tried to break out in the old, uh, you know, the Gen Z area, the Gen Z crowd. Emma, you going to tell us about how you explored Gen Z territory? Is it Gen Z? I don't even know. I, don't, so, I think. I don't it know is. what the generations are. I am quite old. Uh, I did a TikTok, though. It wasn't my first TikTok. It was my second one. But I... Uh, I forget if I mentioned on the show before, but Emmanuel Artichokes is now in Fred Meyer, which is super exciting because that's a store here in the Pacific Northwest, which I don't think I had been to before. So it's cool. I got to go to Fred Meyer and I got to see Emmanuel Artichokes and I did a little video for it. And then I put it into TikTok because you can like stick the videos together and then put some hearts on there and then put a music. It all works pretty well. So I did that and I posted it and it was, the whole thing was, was pretty fun. And you can make it look make it look pretty good you know I've done a lot of video editing before in the past and it's hard to make it not just super awkward and uncomfortable and I think the great thing about TikTok for those of you who might not have used it before is they they automate a lot of stuff for you they're like just do music mode and then you throw pictures in there and it uh makes it look kind of cool and funny and entertaining I I thought you were going to say it's hard to make it not look awkward and uncomfortable and the great thing about TikTok is it's all awkward and uncomfortable, so it all fits in. I thought it should be like that was the secret, uh, well, the secret too. way. Yeah, awkward, like adorkable. It's all adorkable. Adorkable. I think I it's like a good that. way to put it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, because I had, uh, I watched a funny, because in TikTok, you can like quote talk someone and make your video mm-hmm. be on their video and like smush them together. And they did one about uh, having a fight in a grocery store that was like a, <laughs> a musical a broadway musical and then they're just adding layers there was like the person and the child and the can of soup and they're all singing together and it was very dorky but very funny too so i think the the one of that that i saw that amused me the most was the the theater nerd production kids version of that which was just two ladies behind the scenes acting like they were running the tech for a live stage performance of this. <laughs> so like the singing's in the background and they're just giving each other stage commands back and forth. It was just very, very uh-huh. adorable. Very That's entertaining. Awesome. Yeah. Ooh, speaking yeah. of stage commands and then teaching you all about like just movies in general, uh, Isabella, what do you got planned, Isabella? Uh, that was that was a transition. I like that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, oftentimes I, I teach classes uh, and I do different um, uh, presentations and panels and stuff like that. Um, and I haven't gotten a chance to this year because of the dumpster fire that is 2020. Um, 2020. So, um, so I, I, yeah, I'm returning to teaching online um, at the Seattle International Film Festival organization, also known as SIF. Um, and I have a class coming on later on this month, October 23rd, I believe, 
uh, where I'm going to teach about Us, the movie Us, Jordan Peele's uh, seminal horror movie and the separation of the identity and the self. So this is kind of a parapsychological kind of a thing, but it's, it's all about the ways in which we split ourselves in order to uh, survive in a capitalist, patriarchal, sexist, transphobic society and how it makes monsters of us all. Um, and uh, I'm really excited about this, uh, about this class. Registration is now open. So if you're interested in learning about horror movies, um, psychology, trauma, blackness, identity, uh, things like that, then uh, please sign up for the, for the class. I'd love to teach you. Nice. Sounds awesome. And like us I is real good. There's a lot to dig in there. So is, much. Is. The movie is so like every, if you watch it over and over, I mean, I've seen it like 20 times. There's always something new to watch in that movie. It's so good. Mm -hmm. And then we have that link into chat. So, hey, if you guys are interested, please sign up. And then uh, uh, Isabella will lay down the education upon you. Uh, and, and now for me, I guess this week, I've just been trying to think if there's going to be trick-or-treaters, how can I catapult the safest way to <laughs> gently throw candy at children so they still stay six feet away? Like that's that's the, my problem is like, I want how i have three ideas catapult air cannon and long pvc tube tie or tube slide uh i, and, I have another and, idea for you uh, ready sushi right. conveyor belt but candy mm. i love it Ooh, that is that's a great idea <laughs> and just it just picturing. goes around oh, it just goes around it just goes around the whole house Wow. Maybe not the whole house, but down my driveway so I don't even have to contaminate my doorbell. I'll just oh, be like, yeah. here's a piece of candy <laughs> if you want it. Get it. Wow. And some candy. One of those, uh, um, test dummies, right? And like shooting and like piercing the dummy with the candy and saying, like, mm, I need to work on the pressure there. <laughs> and like some of the candy, though, you could like, you know, some of it's like not actually, it's like wasabi dipped in in chocolate or something like that you know Ooh, just so yeah. like, one of us you know. here wants the trick more than the treat i see <laughs> <laughs> either that or the thing that we haven't discussed the the real news is these these 12 foot skeletons uh oh, wait God. or do we just talk about this wait. the 12 foot skeletons at home Depot. i was told no i cannot get it because what are we going to do with it the rest of the year what? So. leave it up <laughs> you leave it Oh, come on, bonsai. You need yeah. did, life. did you not like, show him? On your did, side. did you not show him the picture of the folks who bought one and then dressed it up in like D D combat armor? So now they have a twelve foot That's skeleton totally. with like a shield and a sword and a fur over its back. <sighs> no, but it's okay. It's fine. Smiles? We're making we make adult decisions together. I said no to things, you know, and he says no to things. It's perfectly fine. This is this is what a relationship is. Relationship. Uh -huh. Yeah, but. But yes, no, I digress. Before we get out of hand with giant 12 foot tall skeletons, we do actually have some news today that's going to be really, really awesome, especially if you are into tabletop games and into getting digital, digital. I'm going to talk about the digital stuff going on. Not yeah. this week, but next week. Love that song. <laughs> Love that. <laughs> digital and games go together like peanut butter and chocolate. Uh, I, I love the combination here. The news is that there is a Steam Digital Tabletop Fest, and it's starting on October 21st. Uh, what's exciting about this is when I first looked at it, I'm like, oh, Steam doing a digital sale on digital board games, digital tabletop things, because they do that uh, on a fairly frequent basis. We posted a lot of the sales here. But this isn't uh, a sale. This is actually an event that they're running that celebrates all things digital and tabletop and really digs into the intersection between the two of them, which I think is super exciting. Uh, so it really is more like a festival or a con almost since the first time they've done this. So it's really cool. So well, I think uh, the, the Steam has done a couple other um, online themed events. I think they did one around like indie video games and stuff like that. Hmm. But it's definitely a first time that I've seen Steam really present the digital adaptation of board games as like a category brand thing itself. Yeah, well, I, which is weird because I am 
within the Steam ecosystem, but I had not heard of them doing another event type thing. I think Steam can be have a little trouble promoting and get, getting the word out about all the stuff that it does. Um, so I'm excited to see like and to hear this. They have done many events, and if you like the stuff that on Steam, if you play Steam games, you can get even more into the ecosystem with some of these cool things that they're doing. So there's an independent game studio, Arak Digital, is helping to curate events, speakers, panels, let's plays, and activities. So they have a whole smorgasbord. Uh, lots of different things. Other side, tactical RPG blending strong arts, uh, art style, unique lore, and challenging gameplay. They're doing the creator of Plague Inc., which I played on the mobile version. There's also a board game version of it. So the mm -hmm. James Vaughn is talking about the different versions and discussing, you know, differences between the two. Gloomhaven, they're also discussing the next update to their early access on Steam. Uh, and one of the ones I'm most excited about is a virtual panel about games on Mars, where game creators will be joined by, wait for it, actual space agency staff and scientists uh, to ask wait. about how they get right and wrong, about how board games and digital board games get Mars right and wrong. So, oh, like, cool. how cool is that? Oh, they're yeah. only being cooler if it was actually them on the space station and they're <laughs> floating around like, this is what you got, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, they try to play tabletop like in space. <laughs> oh, <laughs> gosh, yeah. I think they like play board games. I don't even know. I don't know if did, that's did, necessarily uh, in their budget, but yeah. Uh, did any of you see the, the clip that was going around Twitter of the astronaut who was like, when you're in space for a long time, sometimes you forget about gravity. Cause he's oh, like, yeah. basically he's giving a talk <laughs> and like he holds up a pen and he's like, blah, blah, blah. and then he just kind of lets go of it and looks somewhere else. And he comes back and tries to grab the pen and it is obviously not there anymore. And yeah. he's just like, Oh yeah. Gravity. gravity. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think he was like trying to show like what it's like to orbit around somewhere. And he's like, yeah, this is like, so imagine this as the spaceship. And then it's just gonna grab some. It's good. It's a good clip. Uh, yeah, it was very nice. good stuff. So all sorts of fun stuff going on. We posted a link if you want to check it out and learn more about it. Uh, it sounds like it's gonna be a fun event, and for people like me that love the intersection of digital and physical games, it's gonna be all sorts of fun stuff to check out. And it's running October twenty first through the twenty sixth, I think. Yeah. So if you guys have a uh, hey, you know. We're, we're inside anyways, and you will like board games and want to hear more about it. October 21st to the 26th. Just follow that link that we put into chat. Uh, on other news that are 2020, uh, Origins has revealed their winners. Derek? Mm -hmm. So we have the Origins Awards. Um, you know, it was obviously kind of in a, a nebulous state this year since there wasn't a physical convention and the online convention was canceled. So the usual run of revealing the awards and celebrating the winners didn't happen. So uh, they have uh, announced the winners for this year. They've inducted people into you know the Hall of Fame and stuff like that. A couple of the high points we wanted to pull out were Tiny Towns from AEG won Game of the Year. Point Salad uh, won Best Card Game. Uh, you know that's another like local creator uh, team. Um, we've talked about Point Salad a couple of different times. It's a really you know, like clever uh, kind of game. Uh, some other interesting ones to me to point out are Teens in Space won Best Role Playing Game. Um, and that's definitely an indie game that I like personally, I'm really surprised with or surprised with just how much it resonated um, with the community as a whole. Uh, you know, teens on bikes, teens in brooms, uh, teens in space. Uh, Isn't it kids on bikes? No, is that not you know, the same? You're right. Yeah, it's, it's kids on bikes. Yes, I, I think so. Okay, kids yeah. on bikes, <laughs> then teens in space. Then, yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just seeing this game connect with people uh and like the whole genre you know i wonder how much of it is writing off of people loving the idea of stranger things and and translating that into uh an at the table experience of some kind um but it's really nice to see some of these games just explode out of uh kind of the indie market into to wider attention yeah um war cry from games workshop won best miniatures game and you know i'm not huge into the fantasy side of games workshop but there's a lot of really neat stuff in Warcry. Like it's really neat models, but there's also the, like, they have a bunch of these different decks that will like, you can shuffle and randomly determine like what mission you're going to play on what map and where the terrain is going to be placed on that map. So you could 
get some kind of interesting combinations. There's some very neat stuff they messed around with in the mechanics there. Uh, so it was mm -hmm. nice to see that recognized. All right. And no, then, it's, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just saying this is like, uh, like people, like we are just saying some of the games that won. Mm -hmm. If you want to go ahead and get the whole list, please click on the link that we put into chat. There's so many, uh, so many games. And this is, could be, hey, Christmas is coming up. Maybe think of something. If you have that particular person who happens to like board games and or RPGs, uh, this might be a good direction to go ahead and point your, your money at. Yeah, if you're looking to get a new game and don't know, and there's just a lot of options out there, this is a good short list to kind of start some research from. Um, and I think the last game that really leapt out at me personally was Pandemic Fall of Rome. Um, just because I'm a big fan of Pandemic, I've loved almost every version of Pandemic. Um, but some of the ones I actually like the most are the ones that step away from the the disease route. Mm. Um, and like uh, Rising Tide, uh, I think, is an incredible execution of the pandemic mechanics with a completely different theme. Uh, it does make it feel different. And Pandemic Fall of Rome is also kind of the same way. Like you're not fighting diseases. You're kind of dealing with barbarian tribes kind of channeling into the empire from different directions and you can defeat them you can ally with them you can recruit them so it adds just a, a very different layer to the game uh and it's great to see that in the awards list too mm -hmm. Oh, very, very cool. Thank you so much for sharing that list. And like I said, uh, there is a ton more games that are on there. You just have to go ahead and look through them and see what what's what really speaks out to you and good entertainer, what are good quality games, you know. Um, on another related news about games that everyone is really, really excited about, Isabella, are you seeing red, would you say? Oh, yes, I am seeing red. Red for Cyberpunk Red. That's right. The details for the game have been announced. I'm very excited for this. Um, uh, one of the earliest games that I started playing was Cyberpunk 2020. Um, and if you're a, an old head, well, I guess if you're, I don't know, it's not an age thing, but like Cyberpunk 2020 was like such a huge, such a huge mm -hmm. game. It was so influential uh, to the cyberpunk genre. The original cyberpunk game, which came out in 1988 um, by Mike, Mike Pondsmith, who, if you don't know, is like such an influential, the cyberpunk world, I feel like does not get enough attention as much as it should uh, because of the fact that really it's hugely influential. All the games that you've played that in include cyberpunk elements, I'm telling you, they all come from this like original 80s game. That's that might be a spicy hot take, but I will defend that take. It, okay. It's also not you really, will stand really on wrong, that so hill. We I will. You. Thank you, Derek. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I really do. I'm very passionate about this. Also because of the fact that uh, Mike Pondsmith, who wrote the original game, uh, is a black creator, and I feel like mm -hmm. we don't really talk a lot about um, black uh, RPG creators uh, and how much how influential that is. And I feel like he never gets enough credit. Going off of that though, Cyberpunk Red, the details have come out for that. And for those who don't know, Cyberpunk Red is both the sequel to Cyberpunk 2020 and also the prequel to the Cyberpunk 70, 2077 video game that's coming out, which I know that everybody has seen because those videos with uh, baby boy Keanu Reeves um, <laughs> <laughs> went super viral. Uh, and uh, he's, uh, oh man, I can't remember the name of the character that he's playing in that uh, game. Uh, but Johnny it Silverhand, is, I think. Yes, Johnny <laughs> Silverhand, uh, which goes so hard and the game looks incredible, but you really need to be focusing on, uh, on, on this, the tabletop version of it. Uh, Fun fact, though, is that they both come out November 19th. Mm -hmm. Cyberpunk uh, 2077 and Cyberpunk Red, the, the tabletop game, both come out. So prepare your wallets for that. They're, they're doing a lot of coordination between the tabletop and the video game, which is exciting to see. I really mm -hmm. hope that a lot of people will get the video game, love it, and then they will just turn right to the tabletop game to, to get more time in that world. I really hope so too. That's that's really my my because at first when I heard this news, I thought, okay, the game is going to outshadow the the tabletop game. And I thought, 
like, okay, that's, that's not, that's the opposite of what I want. Um, and I really felt kind of like overwhelmed with all the video game news that was coming out. Um, but it really feels like the video game people behind mm -hmm. it are also very mindful of Cyberpunk Red at, at the mm -hmm. same time. And they're trying to tie those two together. And so I feel like, you know, if you're playing the game, uh, I don't remember how, if you can play it co-op or not, um, but I think that playing Cyberpunk Red, moving on to Cyberpunk 2020 and playing the original Cyberpunk, even though the mechanics uh, of the original Cyberpunk are, they're, you know, they're old. They're, they're old mechanics. Yeah. <laughs> they're kind of like, crunchy. They're kind of crunchy. It's from, <laughs> it's from nearly over like 30 some years ago. So like be gentle uh, when you go into that. Um, I think it's really interesting that Cyberpunk Red says that they're going to have twice as large of a core rules as Cyberpunk 2020. That to me, uh, when I read that, I was like, wait, are you guys bragging about this? Because that sounds so stressful. Yeah, um, <laughs> so, because yeah, the Cyberpunk 2020 rules were not, they were stressful. They were, it was a lot. Um, but uh, the fact that they're going to have twice as more, maybe that means that they're going to kind of streamline some stuff, maybe. Um, character creation is going to become um, uh, more thought out. I'm, I'm very curious to see if there's a sort of modernization between the old classic version and maybe how the video game mechanics might work as well, um, just to kind of help people who are coming from the video game to the, the TTRPG, hopefully. That's, that's, my, that's my hopes and my dreams for this, but I'm very excited for this. Um, you know, get a robot arm, hack into the mainframe, <laughs> um, <laughs> become a hacker. Um, and did, uh, I ever, did I ever tell you the, the story of our ill fated cyberpunk game? Like no. back in college. So, like, we, we tried to bust out Cyberpunk 2020. We were going to play it in college. And, uh, you know, we all love Shadowrun, and I would always play the Decker in Shadowrun. So, I'm like, I'm going to play the hacker in, in Cyberpunk. That's cool. <laughs> and we like went through the life path process. And I realized that I didn't have enough money to buy a computer. <laughs> so, like, I felt like it was an extremely cyberpunk question to just turn to the GM and say, Hey, if I sell my eyes, mm. Oh, was that a, will I still be able to see in the net? Like, mm. how does that oh. work out? Because uh, that that felt like a really, really cyberpunk hook of someone had to sell their organs to get enough money to get the equipment to go do illegal jobs. Mm -hmm. That's see, that's the cool thing about uh, about cyberpunk. I feel like it's just it's it's kind of I don't know. It's like whatever goes. Like the kind of um, a biomechanical, sick, twisted. I it. I, I would say the, an F word, but I, we only get one per episode, so I'm not going to say it, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's just, it's, it slaps y'all. It, it's mm -hmm. just it so, it's such a good game. It's fudging it's, good. It's fudging good. There you go. <laughs> so yeah. So November 19, um, you know, please be careful. Uh, uh, if you're going to, if you're going to venture out for black Friday, you might need to sell your eyes um for um that but uh if you're gonna uh invest into the video game also know that the uh, tabletop game comes out at the same time and i highly highly recommend it um so yeah run run the net kids run, run the net. Ha hack the mainframe use <laughs> be a gray hat let's go <laughs> well on, on the good news, uh, we have some good news. I'm going to have to tone it down a bit. Unfortunately, it has been officially announced today uh, that PAX Unplugged has been canceled for 2020. Uh, they have stated they won't have a virtual version of it, but they're investigating and having like a different type of celebration for Pla PAX Unplugged. So if you were excited for that, I am sorry. It is a pandemic still. Uh, and that's just unfortunate how things are happening. And we're just going to have to work through it as we go on, um, on folks. But to from the low note, let's go back on a high note. Emma, tell us <laughs> about our high note so we can end happy. <laughs> okay. I'm ready. I'm ready for it. Are you ready? Hey. Uh, there's a new cat game from Exploding Kittens, folks. Of course, I had to talk about this because it's a cat game and there can never be too many cat games. I collect cat games. One of these days, I'll, I'll show them all off. Uh, I need to get a few more in my collection, though, to really call it a collection. 
but this is a game about shooting balls through a cat's mouth. You have a little paw and you launch the marbles and they go back and forth. It, uh, it's two players playing against each other. Uh, guess, guess what it's called? Tell us, Emma. <laughs> this game's called Cat and Mouth. Cat and Mouth. <laughs> But um. <laughs> so w- w- what I love is your first thought was cat and mouse, but my thought is still hoof and mouth disease. So I'm just like, yeah, cat, cat and mouse disease. Good name. Good name. Dead. You see, look, Chad, Chad is into it. Wow. Cat and mouse. <laughs> That's so on brand mouth. for you, Derek. Uh, <laughs> this is a dexterity game. You have a little paw, catapult the marbles. You know, this is. It's, it's coming from the Exploding Kittens folks. We're known for awesome, accessible, entertaining games. So if that sounds like it's up your alley, check it out. It's out now. So it's currently available if you want to play a fun game and uh, make your pet friends groan with awesome puns. Mm, awesome puns. And, having, mm. and, and the cat board, if you look at it, is a cat throwing up rainbows. So if you don't yeah. like cat <laughs> throwing up rainbows, I don't know what else <laughs> you can do with the world. <laughs> it, it, brings, it brings a joy. I'm, I'm smiling. Look, it brings a smile. It's brought a smile to at least one person's face. So that's enough in these dark times. <laughs> All well, thank indeed. you. All victories. Well, thank you, Emma, for bringing, of course, a smile on our face and chat's face <laughs> for that. Um, oh, speaking of which, chat, if you guys are going to be a little bit confused, uh, we're changing up the, the format for Table Takes today. So right now, we're going to go ahead and go through Kickstarters. And then right after Kickstarters, we have a special guest that is joining us. So now we are, uh, of course, we have dethroned uh, uh, Derek, the Kickstarter queen. Be gone with the Kickstarter queen. And now, again, did I, I miss that memo? did. Because it is now Kickstarter court and court is in section. And so we hand it over to Derek because, you know, <laughs> you should just tell us we about. you <laughs> out, but also yeah. and then open the door. door. But can, so can the, you come back, though? We can you come back. And long live the queen. I see how this works. I get it. Uh, so, ironically, the first game that we have to share this week is Kingdom 2nd Edition. Uh, this has four days left, ending on Tuesday, October 13th. Uh, this is the second edition of another storytelling game from the creator of Microscope. Um, and a lot of people, if you're big into indie games, uh, RPGs, you probably heard about Microscope. Uh, it's a storytelling game where you kind of like hop around through history and you design like a uh, history of a world or the universe or just one particular organization. It's, it's a really neat tool to help kind of set scenes and flesh out backgrounds and stuff like that. And Kingdom is another game that's a little bit in the same vein where you are establishing a quote unquote kingdom, but it could be a kingdom. It could be a zoo. It could be a store run by some friends. It's just, it's an organization of people. Um, and you make characters and each of those characters are either like they represent the perspective of the members or they represent the power who gets to make decisions about what that group does, or they represent the touchstone that kind of represents the values that the group is supposed to, to strive towards. And then you kind of confront that organization with these crossroads, uh, which are difficult decisions, major things they have to deal with. And you kind of just, you know, it's a storytelling exercise where you see how the different characters who are supposed to represent these kind of different aspects, how they deal with the crossroads and how that then in turn impacts the group. So there's a kind of an interesting dynamic. You know, the flippant idea is you build a kingdom and then you tear it down and see how it falls apart. Uh, but this is the second edition of a, like a very well received storytelling game. Um, apparently, it's been you know much improved and slimmed down. Uh, they've added a, a legacies element, which I always have to say, whenever somebody says that this RPG is a legacy RPG, I laugh a little bit because I'm like, how many RPGs aren't legacy games? Mm. Uh, but apparently, this is specifically taking this kind of storytelling game and making it into a more like long running campaign thing, which a lot of these smaller games, these focus games have a little more difficulty maintaining. So there's a new aspect to it. Um, if you like microscope, if you like storytelling exercises, then you should definitely check out kingdom. Uh, you got four days left, uh, give it a shot. And maybe someday 
I will have that opportunity to run an, a quote unquote normal RPG where we have built the world and the factions th- using like games like Microscoping Kingdom so that all the players are kind of invested and they have these memories of what the world is like without me having to be like, cool, we're going to play vampire. Here are a bunch of books of lore you should probably read or I can just talk to you about it. Mm. All right. That's my dream. Dreams. All right. And how many days left is that? It's got four. Four Ends on Tuesday. And now, Isabella, can you tell us about your Kickstarter? With five days left, uh, I'm bringing you the Thing board game. Now, 2020 has been a year of, um, you know, hidden uh, (laughs) uh, inner viruses of invisible (laughs) illnesses. Uh, and then also of uh, uh, murdering your friends. And what I'm talking about is uh, the Among Us game, which is oh. really, really big right now, which takes a lot of its inspiration from uh, a, a indie movie that was actually a box office bomb uh, called The Thing, which uh, the if thing you is haven't so good. So good. So good. But it it's doesn't a cult change classic. The, it doesn't change it the fact that when it came out in movie theaters, people hated it mm-hmm. and it bombed in the movie theaters, you guys, which is like amazing. Uh to there, think there's of. definitely a whole category of movies that just did not survive, were not well received in their first release, but over time found their audience. And like I think the thing is like the iconic example of that. Yes. Also, Blade Runner bombed in the box mm-hmm. office. Hook oh, really? Bombed in the box office. What? what? Yes. There's Scott, no. Pil- yes. Scott Pilgrim, I think, is in that Scott category. Scott Pilgrim too. bombed mm. in the box office. Yes. All of so many of your favorite cult classic films did terrible. And John Carpenter has a long history of like bomb, box office bombs, despite the fact that he's one of the best filmmakers of all time. If you disagree <laughs> with me, fight with your mom. I'm of not gonna time. argue about it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing is one of the best movies ever the practical effects are so cool they still Mm. hold up some 30 some odd 30 40 years later they're still terrifying and grotesque uh and this board game goes along with those elements where i I really love the mechanics of it i love uh, uh that you get to uh sabotage things you're all trying to work together but one of you is obviously the thing if you don't know this is not a spoiler. If you haven't seen the thing by now, I don't know what, like, okay, don't don't pause this, don't leave us, but like, go get the thing right now. You have to watch this movie. It's so good. Um, uh, one person is infected with, with the alien DNA, and their whole thing is that they want to assimilate others to also be aliens as well. Um, and in this game, you can sabotage, but you know you have to do it sneakily. There's a lot of stealth involved. Uh, you can infect other people, and then they can also work with you as you try to do your secret mission of trying to infect other people. Uh, you can pretend like everything's fine. You can start fixing stuff so that nobody suspects you, and then you just open up your mouth, stomach, <laughs> and spray out your tentacles. <laughs> Mm. uh and split your face open and <laughs> chomp somebody just yeah. <laughs> classic the thing you know family friendly activities for the kids um and <laughs> this one is five days left uh it's it's already won its kickstarter but like um and the whole thing is like kind of uh it's kind of pricey um it's uh, to, in order for you to get like the, the core box, but everything that's cool in it, you get the miniature set, uh, you get all the stretch goals. It has so much involved in it. Uh, the miniature set itself is disgusting and you want these. Mm. Um, <laughs> they're so gnarly. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Emma, but there's, um, there's a part where a man's head separates from his body and then his head grows spider legs oh, uh, why? so good why would i watch because uh, it's real good next. it's real it's real so good real cool thumbs up would recommend I am a pants. oh you're not Deary gonna like pants. it it's grotesque um, oh it's good but it's they have good. a figure so of it but they have the figure of all of the major monsters including i think they also have a dog thing uh and if you've ever seen a dog uh insides become the outsides then uh, mm. 
then you <laughs> really like we this. gotta taste that body horror yeah 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 <laughs> The don't fact that you it. want to taste the body horror just makes that whole sentence even better. Don't, don't mm. taste it. Don't, don't lick that. It. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Don't taste it. <laughs> <laughs> so that has five days left, right? It has five days well, left. Sign but up. But now you else. can bring gonna, this. <laughs> yeah. You're going to get assimilated. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Up next with five days left ending Wednesday, October 14th, it's Emma's Dice Corner, which makes me want to do uh, like Griffin's Amiibo Corner, where he puts all the Amiibos in his mouth. It's an old school sketch. You should check it out. It's hilarious. I could like take the dice and see if they fit in my mouth. Uh, I'm not going to do that though, because it's also it's a choking hazard. <laughs> it's a choking hazard. Uh, yeah, choking. Just, just his dice are, are great, and and I like dice in general. But actually, I looked at these dice, and they made me very happy. They're very sparkly and shiny uh and just sparkly in every different way like pink sparkles blue sparkles any type of sparkles that you could ever want uh it's actually a little sad because i looked at it and uh it's 50 dollars for a set of dice which is definitely a little bit on the pricey end it's frustrating for me too because i just want one of each dice there's like all these great dice and like i just want one dice of this and one dice of this. I don't need a whole set. What are you going to do with a whole set of dice? I don't even know. You play a game. That. It's not I mean, just to, <laughs> just, like to go on a limb here. I think you might roll them. I just want to look. At, I just want to hold them and look at it. How shiny yeah. it is. How pretty the, it is. The dark matter ones look really cool. I love oh. the Bellatrix and the Andromeda ones, but I, I just, I just want like one or two. Yeah. I, I don't. I don't. Uh, 50 bucks for like I don't know yeah I mean it was 50 bucks for like seven different types of this like I would probably go in on that they're just like how do I even choose like why don't you reach out to the the Kickstarter creator and be like hey so have you considered (laughs) catering to my very particular weird needs (laughs) (laughs) Uh, (laughs) I'm not like that I'm not that kind of person just do it politely Uh, yeah anyways Check these dice out. Everything dark matter, stardust. You, even if you're not gonna get them, just drool over them. This is my heart. Okay, if you look at these dice and what is in my heart, this is like a visual representation of my my inner soul, my inner spirit. So what you're telling me is that mm-hmm. someone manifesting your inner dream is mm-hmm. not worth fifty dollars. Oh, oh. Wow. Ooh, I got you. Wow. If I but they're all so good. If I had to pick, like they're all my inner dream. That's gonna be like hundreds of dollars. If I think at each one, I don't I don't know if I can commit to that. Why don't you make a list, roll a die, and go with mm. that one? <laughs> I just can't say no. That's the thing. I can't say no to the other ones. Picking one means I have to say no to the rest of them. Uh but yeah, dice are great. These ones are really good. You should check it out. They got five days left. Nice. Um, my uh, pick, oh, my second pick, is a game called Night Parade of 100 Yokai. Um, I love this. This is so adorable. It has six days left, ending on Thursday, October 15th. Uh, if you don't know what yokai is, uh, yokai is Japanese. Uh, they're, they're not exactly ghosts. They're spirits. Um, they're not exactly demons. Uh, they're just otherworldly creatures, uh, and a lot of them are based off of animals, and a lot of them are also based off of household objects as well. So there's like a yokai of a sandal, a yokai of a wall, a yokai of a, of a cat that has multiple tails, um, a raccoon yokai. They're super, super, super adorable. There's a whole lore and whole world of them. And this game, basically the whole point of it is that you're trying to get more yokai to join your parade. And so you're trying to uh, uh, get the yokai so that you can have the longest parade and you can go through Japan terrorizing people and haunting people's dreams and giving So it's a yokai conga line? It's a yokai conga line. (laughs) (laughs) You're trying to get the longest conga line of different yokai spirits to go through Japan, um, which I feel like they should have released an album to go along with this uh, good music. Those those meeples are... Uh, like when I when I saw this and I saw the the giant wide eyed little cat meeples, I was like, someone's gonna love this one. 
<laughs> they're so cute as soon as I saw the meeples I was like all right I don't I don't care about anything else I just want to do this one because uh, the meeples yeah they're so cute um uh, and yeah the deck is really good I love the art um it has really interesting uh they have the nekomata the onikumas the tanukis they have all of your all of your favorites uh it's a really adorable game uh and it sounds like it's uh to get people to understand more of the history of japanese yokai uh, uh it's really interesting and so that game has uh six days left so hop on that it's it's a great nice gentle if you're looking for something for Halloween, something to play around the season that's not too scary, you're. It, this is the tonal opposite of the thing. If you're looking for something to play around, you know, back this one. And this is a nice, gentle, spooky uh, game to play. Yeah, right. Great. Well, also with six days left, just to go through it quickly, is Seventh Citadel, um, which we just wanted to highlight because Seventh Continent was a very big game on Kickstarter. I know a lot of people who backed it. I know a lot of people who really liked it once they had a chance to play it. And Seventh Citadel is kind of a spinoff from that. Uh, you're basically making a character. You're kind of building a village, and then you're exploring this weird, post-apocalyptic, bizarre, medieval landscape, going on adventures, becoming a better character, all that kind of stuff. Um so if you were big into Seventh Citadel or sorry, Seventh Continent, or if you kind of missed the boat on that and you haven't been able to find a copy and you kind of want to hop on the hype train now, here's an on-ramp for you. Looks very neat. There's a lot of special bonuses in there too for the Kickstarters, like Plastic Mini. There's an expansion and stuff like that. But uh, if Seventh Continent means something to you, then you probably should be checking this out. And up next, we have seven days left, ending Friday, October 16th, is Dinosaur World and Dinosaur Island Rar and Right. I just like, like that, Rar and Right. Uh, I think it, like with Seventh Citadel, Seventh Continent, I'm going to say, if you know what these things, if you know what Dinosaur Island is, you're going to hear that and be excited or horrified. If you don't know what it is, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's basically the ideal customer here is the intersection between people who love Jurassic Park, Jurassic World, because it is very much, uh, I played a little bit of Dinosaur Island, it is a straight ripoff, everywhere from the font to the little knockoff DNA character, like this <laughs> is Jurassic, I mean now we actually have Jurassic Park board games, but this is very much uh, just the, the flavor of parks and you're making the park and now in dinosaur world you're driving around you have your car and everything and now it's like um where dinosaur island is jurassic park dinosaur world is jurassic world basically uh these games are just very crunchy and i think this is an important distinction so it's first part you like dinosaurs you like jurassic park you also like very crunchy in-depth games i think the tricky part about this is there's going to be a lot of people out there who love Jurassic Park, love dinosaurs. Everyone loves dinosaurs, right? But mm -hmm. uh, are not quite prepared for the heaviness of the game. I once had someone say like, oh, we've got 45 minutes. We can learn and play Dinosaur Island. And 45 minutes in, we were still setting up the board because there's just a lot of pieces and bits to it. I will say, once you get everything set up and learn all the rules, there's a lot to it. It does flow pretty well like the way that you have the research and the science and everything it's not like crunchy and then two hours later you're still trying to wrap your brain around it because it's it kind of informed by real world stuff dinosaur parks stuff that we kind of have a sense of there's there's a little bit of a flow to it um, so it's, it's just got kind of a steep this. initial curve it sounds like exactly mm -hmm. yeah so if you like it, even the roll and write, the raw and right here, a lot of roll and writes are a little lighter and simpler. This one is crunchier than your typical roll and write. So if you like strategic complex things and dinosaurs, then these things are going to be for you and you should check them out. Seven days left. Dinosaur World and Dinosaur Island, raw and right. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, well, the last project I wanted to cover uh, with seven days left uh, is extremely on brand for Derek. Uh, it is uh, Brinkwood, the blood of tyrants. This is... Uh, basically, you are playing rebels 
who are fighting against vampires who are basically rich people who use alchemical means to drink people's blood and get superpowers and you're leading a rebellion against them and the fae in the forests will give you these masks that help you get enough power if you're willing to make a bargain for it to defeat the vampires mm. so like the tagline of like drink the rich come on uh like oh. yeah like <laughs> That's this pretty metal yeah uh so uh it's extremely derrick uh it looks great um fantastic design a wonderful idea uh and it's another kind of take on the whole forge in the dark blades in the dark idea where you're kind of running a rebellion and you're using you know instead of running a crew of uh criminals or, or a gang you're trying to kind of track how your rebellion is growing um, around this little fiefdom or empire against whoever is ruling it unjustly. Um, so looks fantastic to me. Uh, looks timely. Uh, love everything about it. And everyone should check it out. You got seven days left to jump on board. Mm hmm. All right, friends, that was our Kickstarters of the day. But wait, just wait five minutes. We're going to be taking a quick camera switch uh, to introduce our special guest, uh, Jason Petrie. Petrie, I, even... I believe. Petrie, Petrie. I knew He'll that all along. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, and they're going to be uh, talking about Sig City of Blades. So if you want to hear more about this new game coming up, just stick around five minutes for this camera change. Hi, folks. Welcome back. And we have brought out from the depths of the internet our special guest, Jason Petrie. Hello there, sir, and introduce yourself. Hello. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Yeah, so my name is Jason Pitt uh, from Genesis of Legend Publishing, um, an indie game, role-playing game designer from Ottawa, Canada. Ooh, Canada. Uh, and I've been... It's actually fairly terrifying if you look at my Kickstarter profile because I've backed something to the tune of 500 Kickstarters and I've run mm -hmm. seven. So mm -hmm. I know the rodeo. <laughs> yeah, I think um, you're, you're one of the few people that's rising up there with me. <laughs> yep, yep. It's, uh, it's, trying to bring we have a problem. With you. No, that's a yeah, good like, problem to have. That's, that's great, yeah. actually. I'm, that's awesome. It's half uh, the reason we have that Kickstarter segment is so that I can try to get more people to back more things so I feel less guilty. Uh, yeah, so um, I've been designing for quite a while and I'm currently running a shiny new project. So uh, I, I figured I should talk to you fine folks on Kickstarter number seven. Sweet. So what, what are you working on? So uh, I'm currently working on a game titled uh, Sig City of Blades, mm -hmm. which has a long history to it. Um, basically, I started designing my own game, which was all about co collaborative world building and challenging your beliefs. Uh, then I realized, oh, that actually fits very well with the classic... Uh, second Ed setting of Planescape, which was the thing that turned me into a game designer by opening my mind to the possibilities of what games can be. Mm -hmm. um, so I made a supplement for my first game, Spark, which was Sig the City Between. And it got a lot of positive attention and it kept growing, be, you know, as player settings are wont to be. Um, and so then I produced another Kickstarter to fund an actual offset print run of beautiful hardcover full color books. Uh, that was SIG, the Manual of Primes. And it went from us being a supplement to a standalone game at that point. Mm -hmm. The last stretch goal on that campaign was, hey, if we get to this point, I'm gonna invest some time and uh, work on a uh, Forged in the Dark uh, uh, version of this setting because uh, the setting itself aligns very well with uh, elements of the system, specifically all the faction warfare, tier mechanics, like all of that good stuff uh, works super well. And thematically, it's um, at the right place. It So it just lined up nicely. 
And that was several years ago. Uh, and I've been working away at it since. It's been um, an exciting challenge because Fortune in the Dark games are not the easiest to work on. <laughs> Yeah, I have to say, I'm not, I'm not entirely surprised you picked uh, in Forge in the Dark because like this would be awesome for Planescape was one of the first thoughts I had when I started reading Blades in the Dark. Um, but, you know, I, I guess maybe a kind of fundamental question is what led you to pick the Blades in the Dark system and make a Forge in the Dark game? Like, what do you think that, that those mechanics bring to SIG that, you know, your previous you know, releases maybe didn't have? So my previous release was all about philosophy. It was the philosophy side of Philosophers with Clubs. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> whereas uh, for uh, City of Blades, it's all about the uh, political warfare and the war warfare for territory. Um, the fact that the status and power of various political factions will rise and fall uh, fairly quickly mm -hmm. and uh, sort of that level of faction level conflict was the thing the secret sauce that I really wanted uh, and the moment I saw the original rules in John Harper's bootleggers <laughs> uh, way back in the, in the day um, I fell in love mm -hmm. uh, and then that turned into Blades in the Dark and it's fairly obvious where you go from there. Um, I, I just love the potential. And there was a lot of really nice tech in that system. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. There's, there's a, lot a lot of to tech in that system overall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like that's, that's the thing I'm, I'm curious about. I'm very interested to see how you're going to adapt that to the planar setting. Um, you know, like maybe a little more optimistic than Blades in the Dark is, you know, we'll, we'll see how that pans out. Um, but, you know, my personal love of Planescape also kind of leads me to the other question of, you know, as you're putting SIG together, which clearly, you know, is a love letter to a certain kind of D and D um, what were some of your other inspirations? What are some of the other things that you wanted to kind of bring to that world uh, that, that maybe weren't there originally? So there were a few things, one of which was, um, like in terms of actual um, properties and books, etc., cetera, um, some of the bigger inspirations are the webcomic Kill Six Billion Demons. Fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, <laughs> which, yes. Um, and uh, the comic Saga. Mm -hmm. Also great uh, stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. Uh, Jonathan Walton's um, Planar Codex. Uh, for uh, Dungeon World. Uh, and there were a few others, but th those are sort of the big shining ones uh, that really grabbed my attention. Um, mm -hmm. Effectively, here's some different ways that you can explore the concept from different angles. Um, specifically, uh, the saga element is the um, mundane weirdness and strong romantic elements, romantic interpersonal relationship elements, uh, which I felt there was potential for in Planescape, but the clubs were a little too prominent um, and the mechanics weren't ideally suited for that kind of story. So I wanted to bring more of that personal relationship drama stuff going on. Um, so that was the heart of SIG, wanting to effectively humanize and mature uh, the player fantasy style of game. Okay. Awesome. I, you Earlier you mentioned uh, about factions. I, I'm kind of interested in that. What, so can you give us a taste of like what types of factions are there, what like the player can join and like how they connect with the overall world, like just from like picking your little main, your, your brain in this, in this concept. Yeah. So uh, here's the key basic thing that you need to know about the setting. Uh, there are 15 uh, major planes of existence. Mm -hmm. Three on the elemental ring, three on the ideological, and three on the conceptual. So you get 
plane of flame, waves, wind, stone, ice, justice, tyranny, destruction, order, freedom, dreams, shadow, lore, life, and death. Long list. <laughs> yeah. Only three of them are connected to the city at any point in time. Ah. The city effectively huge tethers, which are effectively planar ports, um, open up and connect to one elemental, one ideological, and one conceptual. And the magic flows in all the influences and uh, the inhabitants of those various planes uh, start moving into the city. So uh, if the plane of flame has the tether, then uh, you wind up getting buildings that are made of solid flame. Uh, people are speaking in smoke um, and there's salamanders who start moving in to that neighborhood. Does that happen on like a regular cycle or is it uh, a little bit random? Or? Not, uh, it happens frequently, but not regularly. Okay. It's, it sounds like there's a very interesting immigration story to look at there too. Uh, yes, actually. So a lot of it is, I wanted to explore how cities change through waves of immigration and then fast forward it uh, to ridiculous extremes. Mm-hmm. Um, so you get, um, yes, we've been in this community. We're refugees who came from the plane of dreams and we've been in this community for five years and now another plane showed up and now the giants are trying to take over our neighborhood. Hmm. Oh. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's the bit that I wanted. <laughs> hmm. Um, and that's the heart of SIG. So you know how I said that all the power flows in? Um, this feeds into strengthening the number of people from various origins, like Polari or Worms or uh, Gnomes or Silva. And it affects uh, the powers, the, all the various gods who, um, for the, at least for the last 20 years, have been able to actually move into the city. Uh, after the czar was deposed. <laughs> um, and the various factions. Uh, so there, in Six City of Blades, there's three main factions that you can play as. And these are all folks who are part, who are aligned with a plane that doesn't have the tether. So they're really low in the pecking order. They don't have much power compared to the big boys uh, hmm. at the top. And they're trying to fight their way up by claiming territory and turf, et cetera. So you can play as uh, members of the Herald's Guild. Uh, they're the Daughters of the Raven. Uh, so they're uh, an all-female uh, group of elite messengers and smugglers. Uh, the Order of Ashen Keys associated with the Plane of Lore which are um, renegade uh, sorcerers, alchemists, etc., cetera, um, who protect forbidden lore. And uh, Glimmer Knights, who belong to the Performers Guild, which are half entertainment, half formal UN diplomacy between the various factions. <laughs> um, now, one of the bigger things is there's effectively no central government going on here. It's very anarchic, um, which means that everything is done by the factions. If you want the trash taken out, well, the cleaners will do it for you. Um, now, they also abuse their power, naturally enough. Uh, and that that's sort of it's that symbiosis where you can only get physical power in the city if you also do something for the city. Uh, so the Sage Collegium holds all the knowledge and they're the information brokers. Uh, the Daughters of the Raven, they're actually uh, USPS. Mm. Uh, they actually own the uh, unified SIG postal service. <laughs> I like that. Uh, and the Glimmer Knights are, um, they're the P 
peace brokers who were trying to keep things under control. Um, cool. So yeah, um, those are some of the big ones. And then you deal with things like the Teachers Guild, River Watch, Dust Keepers, Sig Gazetteer, or my personal favorite, uh, the League of Exterminators. I was really tempted to call them the League of Exterminators, gentlemen, but <laughs> ah. my editor overruled me. Well, one of the things that I'm curious to know is, I mean, there's there's so much going on, you know, the mechanics of it, uh, all the different factions and everything like that. Uh, how did that play into your team? Uh, how did you bring in people that were going to help you um, to bring this game to life? And I'm wondering about the perspectives uh, that each team member uh, kind of added to your game. Right. So I, as I've been working on this over a series of different Kickstarters, I've had a chance to bring in a fairly huge uh, collection of folks. Um, in uh, one of them was uh, I got a whole bunch of setting of um, prime worlds, mortal worlds created by some brilliant folks in the industry, um, such as Alex Roberts of Starcross slash uh, For the Queen, um, Liz Chiapratical from Angry Hamster Press, who's recently done oh, Familiars of Terra and Afterlife. Um, I've uh, uh, Strix, Whitney Beltran, uh, there's a pile of people um, who contributed early on and their visions fed into things. Um, and I've been trying to work with some, I, I try to work with an international crew and hire some folks um, from underrepresented groups. Uh, my editor on the project is a, um, Disabled Canadian editor, friend of mine. Uh, our lead artist is a Colombian illustrator. Um, our second artist, who were this close to getting on board, uh, is Alex Louise Hill, an Indonesian artist, animator. Um, Quinn Murphy is lined up as a stretch goal. Uh, and... Uh, we might, we might even have Jeff Stormer running an actual play podcast with a suite of uh, diverse creatives. Because in a setting this large, you need to be talking, uh, looking at it from diverse perspectives. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it's the heart of cosmopolitan fantasy. Uh, and I've already used up most of the uh, uh, cis white guy quota for the game. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, awesome no i like i like that you're tying it in because you're you're right it is like a very vast world you're working with yeah. and it makes sense that in irl you get a vast world connection as well mm -hmm. so i like that tie-in all right you mentioned on twitter that you've seen a strong response to this project more so than other projects uh what do you attribute that to do you see it as a swelling up just a slow burn over time or something in particular about this project uh well there's a few things one of which is uh it's 2020 so um having the option of hey can we have a game where we can stab our problems out and it gets fixed <laughs> Like that has a lot of appeal right now. Mm -hmm. um, the other half is I, you know, I've just plain grown uh, as a creator. Uh, and of course the third half, uh, because everything has to come in threes, uh, is the fact that quite frankly, Blades in the Dark is an impressive um, community mm. uh, that welcomes more games and uh, is very enthusiastic. It's great to have that kind of a, I mean, you've been working so hard, you know, over the course of uh, all, all of the, not only the games that you've made, but also like the Kickstarters that you've backed and that kind of a community and to like see that grow into something this huge. That's really awesome, so. Well, so how long is left in the project? Uh, the campaign has another, ooh, how long? 
21 days. Uh, so I started it on October 5th. So there's plenty of time for people to jump in. Mm-hmm. Um, it's already hit goal. Uh, I was not ex- expecting it to have hit goal this early. <laughs> nice. uh, Congratulations. I'm not <laughs> um, but uh, well, I mean, that just means that we can hit some of those stretch goals you're excited exactly. about. Exactly. You know? And they're yeah. very there's, shiny stretch goals. Um, mm-hmm. Seriously. There's, there's like, more art, you know, better printing. You got, you know, Quinn Murphy up for an adventure and stuff like that. Um, I strongly recommend people go to the uh, Kickstarter page just to see um, one illustration down in the goals section. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, there is an illustration of a denizen of Sig done by Alex hmm. uh, Louise Hill, who is a squid man. <laughs> <laughs> yep, a disgruntled and slightly shady looking squid man with a shovel and a bottle of some unknown substance. Hmm. I want Alex to do more of these. This is why I need backers. <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, we've got a bit of time left and uh, hopefully we can hit some of those stretch goals so that we can get as many of these beautiful books out in the world as possible. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I've backed, so I've got my fingers crossed that it'll appeal to some other folks. Uh, and you know, I appreciate you having, uh, or you, you joining us on the show. Um, I appreciate all of the Planescape Easter eggs that you sprinkled through your discussion with us. Uh, they were noted and appreciated, sir. Uh, <laughs> is there anything else that you kind of want to share or hammer home to people before we uh, let them go check it out? Uh, just that the reason why this game was so interesting Uh, and has captured so much attention is because it offers a window into a more diverse and inclusive fantasy setting. And I think that it's a theme that we're going to see more and more of, of these welcoming, inclusive, diverse uh, settings are better for everyone. Mm -hmm. Um, So I'm glad that there's been such an uptake. Um, so that we can bring more of these kinds of games in the future. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you for just sharing your passion and everything with us about this this game. And like we said, we dropped the link in the chat right now. So if you guys Mm -hmm. want to go check it out, do it now. Get that stretch goal so we can have more squid men. (laughs) Uh, And happy lizard centaurs. Oh, happy lizard centaurs. All the good stuff. But yes, folks, that was Table Takes uh, here with us. And hey, don't forget, there is more than just Table Takes here at Gen Con. We also have uh, on Mondays, all of these are in Pacific time, by the way, 6 p.m. Board Games with the Brothers Mirth on Monday. Wednesdays, we have at 1.30, This Game Gets Dicey. At, and then uh, at 4 p.m., we have Fireside with Peter Atkinson's. Friday, of course, you have us. 2 p.m. table takes um, as well. And don't forget to like, subscribe, follow, click that heart, tweet about us. You know the deal. It's social media. Just spread it everywhere. (laughs) If you can't watch us live, don't worry. We're going to have the videos up on YouTube 24 hours after that. Um, And you know what? Thank you again, Jason, so much for joining us and sharing this passion. And we hope we hit more of those Kickstarter goals. Uh, Thank you as well, Isabel. Derek and Emma for joining us. I hope you guys have a great, great, great evening and goodbye. Bye. Bye, Wash your hands. Register to vote. Register.